Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 248 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers, here as always with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm li- I'm alive. Oh, my God. I live. Yes. So for those of you following along at home, I mean, we try to we try to cover it well, but we have both had sickness in our homes and in our lives yes. and in our voices over the last couple of weeks. So recording. Yeah, we both went out for like we were both taken out for like essentially a week. Yeah. And one not, right after the other. Not the same week. So no, um, thankfully. <laughs> so you will hear it in our voices. But we are here with you today. We are talking about today 10 things we love about raising siblings. So about a month ago, we did an episode called 10 things we love about toddlers. Um, and that you you all seem to love that out there. But the idea behind this is sometimes there are frustrations or phases of motherhood that don't feel so lovable and that kind mm. of get um, get a bad rap or that we like to, you know, complain about and vent about. Toddlers <laughs> came came first to mind. Yeah, that was like already in our minds. We're just like, yep, let's do something on that. Yeah. So not to sugarcoat something that is genuinely challenging, because you all know that's not what we do here. But I do think it's interesting to when we're in a challenging phase to try to look for the positives. And Megan, will you talk a little bit about when you did this over the holidays? Because we had a lot of listeners write to us when you mentioned this. Um, Oh, yeah. And it kind of almost inspired this series, this 10 things we love about series. Yeah. So I was coming into what what was now my fourth um, holiday since separating and coming into it being single, I somehow have not made it like I've dated a lot, but I've never made it through a holiday with somebody. Mm -hmm. So I came into this one single and decided to kind of intentionally be single about it and wait until after the holiday before I resumed any dating style activities or anything like that. So I was keeping a journal about the things that I thought were that I was grateful for that made like things that were positives about being single at the holiday or anytime. And um, it was helpful, you know, like, it's helpful to look and say, this is one thing, whether for me, it was um, the passenger side of my bed has my cat and my book in it. (laughs) And that's cool. Like, I like that. Like, that was sometimes something like that. Or I can devote as much of my time um, as I want to my kids during the holiday. And otherwise, it might be feel a little bit, you know, conflicted and stuff. So it was really helpful to do that through the holiday. So I think that did kind of spark this idea of like, maybe instead of just gritting your teeth and suffering through something that's not ideal, um, a phase that you're maybe not super happy about, you can always find something. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. and and we know with like with a gratitude practice that there's even science behind that when we right. are noticing the little things. Um, but uh, so I think we will continue to do this 10 things we love about and just, you know, highlight different seasons or different challenges. I picked raising siblings because in my house right now, I will just be really honest 
there's a lot of bickering. And it's funny Mm. because sibling fighting has never been a huge trigger for me. You know, when they were little tiny and, you know, taking toys or pushing each other. um, I just felt like that was par for the course. It's not that I loved it, but it it didn't um, it didn't great on me. And I think with the personalities of my kids, I did I did my my second and third kids. Reed and Violet did go through a phase where they just like just were oil and water. But I don't know. I feel like right now, and I'm sure you can relate, Megan, the bickering has reached this. It's a very um, a much more mature intellectual <laughs> bickering that yep. just is constant in the background. Uh-huh. And I find myself being like, guys, why are you opting into this conversation? Like, why? who whose idea is it to fight about this? It doesn't make any sense. There's nothing at stake. Like, why are you laying down yeah. arms about something? It's like, it'll be the most random hypothetical situation or they do a lot of correcting each other, mm. like for no reason. So maybe can you give me a little, like, do you know what I'm talking about? This kind of bickering? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the older and smarter the kids get, the more obnoxious <laughs> the bickering gets. It's bickering for sport, really. It, it I is. think it's it's often boredom or it's like almost reflexive. Like they're not even... They're not even thinking before they do it. No, they just jump right into it. And to them, like, it's just like white noise to them. Yes. Like it's it doesn't bother them at all that they're always just at each other's throats. But like, especially in a family where you really want that harmony between older kids and you want everyone to get along. So it's partly like just annoying. Yes. And then it's also partly like disappointing, (laughs) you know, so it's like the two sides of the same coin. I have remember having and some of my children at specific ages have been worse than others about um, perpetuating mm-hmm. that stuff. And I have definitely had to ask the question, like, why is this happening? Yes. Like, why do you care? Why is this a conversation? <laughs> and they don't have any answer for it. Right. It's not. Yeah. So I am with you. It, it is a phase that can last longer than you'd like and be more annoying the longer it goes on. And I think you're so right. White noise is a perfect descriptor because they are not emotionally traumatized by this big right. in the way that, you know, there are some sibling dynamics where it really it does feel like the relationship is almost at stake. One of them is really picking on or being bullied or there's some like jealousy dynamic. This doesn't feel like that. It feels like the stakes are very low, but it's this, yes, it's the white noise background. And I think you're right. There's a sport, a sport aspect to it where they're honing their debate skills they're jockeying for like intellectual power almost. And like yep. they do a lot of, yeah, like correcting each other, like even correcting each other's grammar or the way that they said something. Mm-hmm. Or it's just like, oh, my gosh, you guys. Reed and Violet right now are sitting in the third row of the minivan. We just we did some seat shuffling and Violet's booster ended up back there. And something about the proximity, they it's like they get in the car after school and they just start. It just and it's just nonstop. And they wake <laughs> up in the morning and it just starts. So anyway. So I did pick 10 things we love about raising siblings as a little way for myself to remember the reasons why it's fun and fulfilling to have a house full of siblings. And this is also a good time to mention, of course, that if you are intentionally or not by choice raising an only child, we, you know, we know there are both gifts and also hard things that come along with that. We actually have a great episode in the archives about raising only children. So We're coming at this because this is what we know. We are raising packs of siblings. You have five. I have three. This is not to say that raising siblings is better than not raising siblings. It's just mostly that Sarah needs a pep talk about why it's great to have a house full of siblings. (laughs) Well, and I guess if you have only children, you can just listen to this rant and vent part at the beginning and then turn it off and feel really good by yourself. (laughs) Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies. But having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start ritual or add essential for women 18 plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. 
We are welcoming back Dr. Mom Butt Balm as a sponsor today. And Megan, I guess you must be back to changing diapers again, right? Now that you have a step grandbaby in the mix. I have changed a few lately, Sarah. And yeah, it really takes me back to that memory from early motherhood. I actually always enjoyed diaper changes unless they were the really gross toddler ones or if there was diaper rash involved. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember being so stressed out, like gearing up for the saddest diaper change ever. Your baby knows it's going to hurt. You know they're going to cry. It is just the worst. And having to use goopy, gross diaper rash cream definitely didn't help. Dr. Mom Butt Balm was developed by a mom who's also a doctor when she couldn't find any traditional products that worked for her baby's persistent diaper rash. This pediatrician-approved formula is made with all quality ingredients and no artificial dyes or preservatives. And since it's easy to remove, you won't have to wipe and wipe to get it off of your baby's skin. That is so important, especially if they're already a little chafed. And I love the way this formula feels. A little goes a long way. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, Megan, I'm having you go first. What is one thing you love about raising siblings? So one thing I thought of, and I I know this is different in certain families, but um, at least in my family, none of the kids look that much alike if you really took them apart. Like if you said coloring or like hair and eye color features or whatever, they they all have different features. They all have different, like a range of hair colors and Mm -hmm. eye colors. But if you put them all in a room, it's like, oh, you see that they're all part of the same clan. And I love that. And I think that's a very similar or a very common thing with multiple siblings mm-hmm. where it's like you wouldn't necessarily like if someone did a care like a sketch, <laughs> what's like a, like they do at the police station. Yes. yes. Where there's been a crime. A composite. Like, a composite. Thank you. Like you wouldn't necessarily put two of those together and say they look related. But then when you see them as part of the whole, it makes sense. It, it's just this weird like there's a samesiness to yes. them all, even though they're all very different. And that's something I've really, I just find fun to, do you, to check out. Do you remember when they were babies, like as you added each baby, do you remember looking for similarities or looking for sibling um, resemblances or um, yes. did it more happen and as they got older? No, I think it was more when they were in uh, uh, newborns. And I will say they all had a, um, there were a lot of similarities in them as newborns, actually. They all had the, there was just certain features Mm -hmm. that were strong when they were newborns, um, particularly um, Isaac, Owen, and well, really Isaac and Owen really had a very similar look. And maybe I'd throw Clara in there too. But like, (laughs) then as they got older, they all really took on their own look. Like I wouldn't say any of them at a year old looked a whole lot like any other one Mm -hmm. at a year old, even the ones who look more similar now. Um, really went through phases where they looked very, very different. Some were very fair and some had curly hair and some had really chubby cheeks and like they all were just different. And so now it's kind of fun to see them all in this group and go, oh yeah, like they all look like they belong together, but none of them is like the spitting image of any other one. Yeah, I love that. And I also have kids who don't look a whole lot alike. Um, And I came from a family where my siblings and I don't look a whole lot alike. I find it fascinating when people do have those Mm. Those families where they're all they look like carbon copies of mm-hmm. one another. And I I mean, I've heard that there are there are genetic traits that make siblings look alike or there are families where that happens and then others where they don't look so much alike. So I do find that really interesting. Well, in my family, what's interesting is my oldest two siblings are um, just built differently. So my sister, Catherine, and my brother, Buck, are 10 and eight years older than me. And they look more alike, like Mm -hmm. there's something about their their face shape and like their size. Mm -hmm. They're both a little more slight and they just they just look alike. I I can't describe it. Mm -hmm. And then my brother John and I look very much alike, like we both have long, skinny feet and legs and freckles and people see us out and they know that Mm -hmm. we're related. But then if you put the four of us together, like it's very obvious we're all siblings. Yeah, but we don't. But the two pairs are very separate in the way we look. And I, I don't understand it. People will look at my sister and I and say, I can totally tell that you're siblings, but if you really look at us, we don't look that much alike. It's something, mannerisms maybe, uh-huh. there's just certain family dynamics, um, but that's kind of fun to watch. I, I think it's really fun to watch. I have this memory of having newborns and just almost seeing the previous newborn's face in uh-huh. that newborn. Like like you said, that there there is a, like, this is the stamp of my, what my newborns look like, even, yes. th- even though as they got older. And I, um, when I had the third, when I had Violet, 
um, you know, iPhone photography and photo collages, everything had just gotten a lot easier. So I remember doing a lot of side by side collages of um, all three at the same age. You know, I would do it like right. this is all of them. And they really do look pretty different. But there is there is that there is that look. Famous. Yeah, I love that. OK, yeah. well, something I love about raising siblings is also kind of baby related. And that is when a new sibling, so a, a second or subsequent sibling will start to not only recognize their big sibling's voice, but almost prefer any kind of exposure or interaction to a big sibling almost over mom or dad. And I remember it happening maybe three or four months old, maybe a little bit older. I'm not sure, but I just have this memory of the baby craning their head or you'd be Mm -hmm. nursing the baby Mm -hmm. and they'd pop off and just look around because they'd hear the sound of their big sibling. And it was like, it was like the best thing that had ever happened to them. And it was Mm. this kind of the earliest realization that there's a relationship. And I know this is going to be a recurring theme today, but a relationship that's really separate from you as a mom that they will build with each other. But it just is so cute the way. So my sister has a two year old and an eight month old. And just the way a baby will, their eyes will track and they'll just like, there's nothing they'd rather hear or see than whatever that sibling is doing. And usually the yes. sibling is a completely ordinary, like, you know, not just super, well, they're and just a toddler or whatever. The baby is thinking like, will that be me? I almost can see the wheels turning in their yeah. head. Like that's what they're aspiring to be. They're not really aspiring to be us. Yeah. <laughs> like the adults, they're aspiring to be the toddler because they're the one doing all the interesting stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I love it. And it, there's something about, I mean, it takes a couple of months, I think, because of course they they only have eyes for mom and milk and stuff for a little mm-hmm. while. And then I just remember like, oh, they're recognizing their sibling's voice. And then all of a sudden they're not just recognizing it. They're like preferring it, looking for yes. it, you know, yeah. and they so it's just the cutest. It is very, very cute. Well, obviously we can't I mean any any topic about siblings is going to focus on a lot of relationships. Yeah. So my next one does as well. Um, and that is watching the dif- the siblings develop tight relationships with different siblings and then watching that change. So mm-hmm. in my family, and we've talked about this on the show a lot, there's two sets of boys, mm-hmm. you know, and really for a long time, um, especially when there were only two, those were the tightest relationships. Like the kids who were two or fewer years apart. Right. Just naturally spent more time together. They play with the same toys. They play with the same groups of kids. Like, but then what's really happened um, over, you know, since they kind of all got into like upper elementary and later is those alliances started to shift over time. And so, for example, Will and Isaac, who are four years apart, when they were about 16 and 12, started bonding over music. And so that's something that they share now that they're 20 and 16. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was really adorable. Like you'd see them sitting on the couch together with like sharing earbuds Mm. as Isaac was like introducing his favorite music to Will. And Clara and Jacob are really close and they're 11 years apart. Yeah. Um, And they're just, they just get along. Like they understand each other. And I think Jacob feels a little bit of um, what's the protectiveness because Mm -hmm. she's the littlest. And, you know, she's also in a time of life when she's being kind of snubbed by the older ones. Like Mm -hmm. she's, she's very self-aware about it, but she'll say, well, I know that I'm the littlest and it's like everyone's job to be mean to me right now. Um, (laughs) Like I know this is normal. Yes. She knows it's normal. In fact, they'll tell her it's normal. They'll say, we're being mean to you for your own good. (laughs) And like, you know, she'll say, I know I can sometimes talk too much. And my jokes aren't always very funny. It's like she sees them as like shepherding her into being a bigger kid. And so she almost seems it sees it as like benevolent in a way. But I think that Jacob's always got her back. Mm -hmm. And so and he doesn't feel any need to like, you know, he's the oldest. He doesn't feel any need to like crap on her because she's the littlest. Like he he has the whole family under him. Like he doesn't need. So it's just it's really cute to watch. And it changes. It changes all the time. And I'm I'm curious what it'll look like in five years, like who will be like the ones hanging out yeah. or, you know, who will be spending time together? I don't know. Have you noticed that in your family? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the biggest shift was for and my kids are more evenly spaced. It's just two years and then a little over two and a half years. Um, but the biggest thing for a long time, and I've talked about it, was having, you know, two older kids and a baby or two two kids and a toddler. And it just felt like um, and then the personalities of Reed and Violet, number two and number three, are just really, really opposite. So It took forever. And then probably when they were about five and seven, yeah, so like a couple years ago, um, you know, Allegra started aging out of little kid stuff. And now it's definitely a preteen and two Mm -hmm. kids. And so Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was just the shock of these two kids who 
had never related and they're, you know, different genders and the whole thing, um, all of a sudden are very buddy buddy. And they they even kind of look a little bit more alike than they used to. And they they play in a way that's very, you know, elementary school. And now, Mm -hmm. you know, the odd one out is the older. So, yes, I mean, I've definitely, definitely seen it. I think I've told you before that it's been interesting to see um, the boy, Owen and Will, all of their cousin Jack is Mm -hmm. in in between Owen and Will. Yes. And it's been really interesting to watch like where the alliances lie, like who hangs out more. So for a while it was Jack and Will and now it's really Jack and Owen. And like next year they'll all be in high school. So Uh will they all hang out together again? Like it's really hard to say, um, but it changes a lot. And having Jack's almost like the control. Uh He's like the guy in the middle. (laughs) It's like he's like the 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 monitor like the thing that tells us kind of which way the wind is blowing right. as far as the maturity level yeah. of the other two well someone yeah. has to either age up or play down you know like yep. play up or yep. play down it's so interesting yeah um okay so something else i love about raising siblings i love and this doesn't happen all the time but when my kids are fighting or arguing and something can resolve itself using whatever i have tried to teach them and impart to them over the years whether that's like you know, taking turns or apologizing or talking something through. And like, I can be in the other room and just hear a squabble go down. And it could be a big one. You know, someone's crying, someone's yelling. And then I just wait a beat and I I (laughs) listen to them in their own kind of imperfect way, figure something out. And it's like, it feels like I won like an Olympic gold medal. So I I guess I'm putting that out there because if it's never happened to you yet, (laughs) it could happen. It it may. It may take years. And all of the conflict resolution that you're doing, and I don't think there's one right way. I know some parents are more hands off and some are really involved. And I am here to say, I think there's many ways to teach kids to resolve conflict. So I'm not, I don't, subscribe to one particular method, but whatever you've been trying to do over the years and whatever you've been trying to model and however you've been trying to get them to get along, it may Mm -hmm. take years, but you will be in the other room one day and you'll hear somebody apologize to their sibling or you'll hear them offer a compromise or you'll hear them even, you might even just hear them walk away and say, I'm not, you know, I need to like remove myself, but whatever it is, you'll hear it happen and you will feel like a million bucks. Yeah, that is so true. And I mean, all of these things, they're like hashtag mom goals, right? Right. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, But I mean, that will happen at some point. And it could be happening now and you're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. Like maybe like there's some hope there that it's already happening and you're just not noticing. it. Well, or like like little little bits of progress. The kid who used to hit as their automatic, Mm -hmm. maybe they're not hitting. Maybe they're still, you know, instigating or, you know, crying or whatever. So, yeah, that progress is glacially slow. And if you have kids whose personalities don't mesh, and I do have a pair of those, it Mm. just can seem like it's going to it's never going to happen. Um, But it's really cool when it does. And I'm sure you get to hear all kinds of more adult arbitration and, you know, like things happening that are just, you know, completely independent of you. It is. And and I'm thinking back to like when, when we've had these conversations before about not intervening or not intervening too soon. And I think sometimes like you almost have to wean yourself off. So like it's a win if you usually would jump in and break up a fight right away, but you give it 10 seconds yeah. next time, like yeah. that's a little win. So uh, every little step you can take to kind of start removing yourself from the process yes. um, gets you toward where you're trying to go. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I'm just going to be honest. Um, when I had a house full of little kids and was trying to launch my writing career, or at least, I mean, by the time they were all in the house, it was already well launched, but I was still trying to keep it going. And and it really took the pressure off that I had this big group of built-in playmates. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah, we've talked about on the show before about our strengths and weaknesses as moms. And while I think that I've always been great with like the emotional nurturing and guidance part, and I never really minded changing diapers, doing the dishes, like that stuff has never bothered me. Mm-hmm. Um, but playing is just a skill set. Like with a little kid, mm-hmm. I just never developed that skill set. And nor did I really want to. Yeah. Uh, And it was really nice to have siblings to take some of that burden off. Um, They all definitely preferred each other as playmates Mm -hmm. like early, early on. And that was just fine by me. I had no desire to sit and play. And so I remember a couple of times, though, having more than a couple of times having this conversation where a kid would kind of come in and hang around me. And I'm like, what did I make you all those brothers for? (laughs) Go go play with them. Go find one. 
go find one of those brothers. There's so many. I'll just go pick one and play with them. And so that was never that hard. Like sometimes it would be because they were feeling left out or whatever. And I'd have to go kind of help. Yeah. Smooth things over. But most of the time they had no trouble finding ways to amuse themselves. And that really helped that that took. Um, we all have things that feel like a burden. Yeah. And that would that was a big burden unloaded, which is kind of funny because some people would think keeping up the laundry right. of five kids or like the dishes from five kids or, you know, the emotional support for five kids would be a burden. And for me, it really wasn't. I would much rather let them all play together and then me kind of come in and cl- do the cleanup. Yep. And like fix all the hurt feelings afterward. And yeah. Stuff. I mean, yeah. I can relate to a lot of this. And it's funny. I know we we get so many questions about family size and adding another baby. And I know we've talked about one thing you hear when you decide to have three and not four or two is that, oh, there's going to be an odd man out. And for a long time, I really kind of dismissed that and thought, well, you know, it's not just odd and even numbers like you, you can't guarantee that that any four will gel into two pairs. Right. And I think we've had a whole discussion about this. However, having just had three kids for a while now, I can say that there's a li- there's a nugget of truth to the fact that there will sometimes be an odd man out. And I can really see how when you had four little boys, it was like, okay, now now there's truly a pack. Like you've got to be able to find somebody. Whereas in my house, there have been more times when it's two playing and one on the outs. But there's also lots and lots of times when they will play together. And I just have to say for the record, I am the same. I also do not enjoy most make believe or get down on the floor ways of playing with a little kid. I'd rather go on a walk or go to the library or like do something. Um, Mm -hmm. So that is, that has also been a challenge in our house. And I was laughing when you were talking about, you'd rather clean up the mess afterward. And I, I still, to this day, if the three of them can find something to do, it's almost always a gigantic mess. Like they decide (laughs) to get out like some kind of science experiment or like build a guinea pig fortress in the garage. Like it's always a spectacular mess. But if all three of them are involved for an hour and a half, I am much more willing to help with the cleanup. It's like it's just a currency, right? It's a currency of time and and mental space. That And don't you also feel like when you're cleaning up, you still get to be like a mom? Like you're still in mom adult role. You're not playing this weird like, (laughs) am I mom or am I like six? Like like that. I really kind of enjoy coming and cleaning up the mess because it just fits with like the way I like to be in the world. I like to kind of be a grown up and, you know. Yeah, and it's your home and your space and and you can, you know, put love and care into writing whatever wrongs have occurred. (laughs) I've been been committed against it. Um, And I agree, though. There is always some element, uh, evens and odds of someone being, I think just the more people there are involved. So, like, I think if there were four, there were still usually often someone left out. Yeah. And sometimes three can become the gang and one is left out. I would say Clara was probably the one who didn't quite fit in the, like the gang um, aspect as much. And like not to say she was totally left out and no one played with her. It's just that she didn't necessarily want to play the yeah. same way, especially by that point. We're talking about four significantly older siblings, yeah. all boys. Yeah. Um, so she, she was more of my sidekick. And it just worked out that the kind of stuff she wanted to do was very easy for me to work around. Yeah. It yeah. was a lot of crafting and drawing and like playing with little plastic things yeah yeah she was your little (laughs) your little buddy she was my shadow yeah 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 Yeah. and there's elements of violet in that as well for me sarah when my kids were little i was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin i knew that modern kids diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps but i also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. 
Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash mom hour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit to something much more uh, material. (laughs) I love hand-me-downs. I love the clothing, the clothing stories that come with raising siblings. Um, And I have always, actually, even in my own clothing, had a very kind of emotional or um, almost like metaphorical, like held on to significance with different articles of clothing. I just... I I have a lot of memories associated with clothing and outfits, um, and and that even predates kids. But once I had kids, um, the ability to pass down clothes and then to remember things through clothing, and and even just the satisfaction of getting getting a lot of use out of something. I'm mm-hmm. mostly picturing clothing, but it could also be your strollers and your car seats and your baby carriers and all of that. So it was just something. I can't explain it, just fulfilling or emotionally satisfying about that. And um, so hand-me-downs is one. And um, we had a lot of clothing that was passed down to my oldest from family friends um, or neighbors or, or, you know, other friends. And so there would be articles of clothing that Violet wears now that were even somebody's before Allegra's. And so I just, yeah, I love it. I love hand-me-downs. Um, I'm just going to steal this one for my next one as well, because I also love hand-me-downs and the systems part of my brain, like you were saying, you like the idea of getting a lot of use out of something. There was something so satisfying to me back when, I mean, and this was a fleeting, maybe six to seven year period of my life where literally everything passed down from oldest to youngest. Mm -hmm. It was like, boom, 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 boom. So, and I had systems around it. So Jacob would wear it for a year or two. It would end up with Isaac. Then there'd be like a year in between where nobody really got it. And then it would go to Will and then it would go to Owen. And that lasted for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was so satisfying. Like it satisfied all those things. My systems for putting things away seasonally meant Mm -hmm. I got to look at everything and touch everything. And that was really fun for me and and nostalgic, like you said. But it was also like, wow, this is so efficient. Like Mm -hmm. I am getting as much possible use as I can. Like four kids are using each of these pieces of clothing. And then what happened is they all started growing at different rates. Yeah. And that completely like that fell out the window, probably around the time like Will was getting into upper elementary school. Mm -hmm. The system broke. Yes. Um, And so we kind of had to work around it and some stuff passed down and some didn't. And also sometimes some kids ended up being a lot harder on their clothes. And so there's just it became a little less um, reliable. But when it was, there was something about that that was just like amazingly satisfying to me. And now it's so fun because now that there's three giant boys Uh well two young men and a in a giant teenager and then a quickly growing um, other teenage boy they still do sometimes share clothes it's just changed a lot like certain kids have almost sometimes adopted like the other one's entire wardrobe like I remember one time Isaac got rid of almost everything and then the kids kind of like all like vultures came in and oh I love that picked out the stuff they liked the best and ended up like basically just co-opting his whole wardrobe Um, I think sometimes it's a little bit of a status symbol to like borrow a hoodie from your favorite sibling, like your favorite older sibling. (laughs) Like wearing wearing the colors of your, like wearing your boyfriend's Letterman jacket or something. Yes, I have totally seen that. my favorite brother's hoodie. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. And so I've seen like there be some, some favoritism from certain kids towards borrowing or taking clothes from whoever they perceive as the one that they want to like confer respect upon. Mm -hmm. The sibling who gets the respect. So it's been really fun to watch. It's just very different. It is much more like it's much more. Yeah. Like like teenagery. Yeah. And more of an exchange, now. more of a more yes. of a clothing yep. swap than a than a yep. line passing down. Um, I think one thing that I love about it is it it makes so tangible the growth that kids do, which, of course, mm. you don't notice like day to day to day. Um, Allegra's always been tall and big for her age. So she was always wearing a size or two sizes ahead, which means even though the girls are four and a half years apart, they're sometimes six or seven because Violet is about average for her size. Um, But it was even longer than four and a half years until Violet would fit into whatever Allegra had outgrown. And I I remember putting away these bins. This is especially since we moved to California. Allegra was six when we moved. Um, So I'd put away a bin that was like size seven, eight or, you know, even eight to 10. And it just felt like that I, like Violet is never going to be this big at the time she was like two or something. 
And and then every once in a while, I'll be like, hey, I think we could get down. And Violet gets so excited to get down to bin <laughs> because it's like Christmas. You're going through all of these. And sure enough, like she's seven. She's she wears about her age. Like so she wears like a seven, eight. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I never thought you'd be this big. I, there's something about um, just like just acknowledging how much they physically grow um, and the right. clothes are part of that. So it's really fun. I love it. So another thing that I love is I love just listening. And this is so funny because I started this whole episode talking about listening to them bicker. And this is really just the flip side of this. But I love listening to their conversations and specifically listening to them educate or school each other on something that one of them maybe feels more worldly or more informed about. And I think I noticed this, especially because I was the oldest. So I didn't have anybody explaining the ways of the world to me unless it was my parents. But more likely it was my friends, right? Like my friends and I would be off talking about something and I'd have something mature explained to me or whatever. (laughs) But with the kids, I I get to hear them explain to each other what what a slang term means or what like. And and it's just like, first of all, it takes the pressure off me. I don't have to explain everything and it's also kind of adorable when they don't really get it or they're, they're I was trying to say yeah. when they're wrong or like almost wrong. right uh-huh yeah and you don't have to jump in like they're they learn yeah. so much from each other um mm-hmm. and I almost feel like they're more comfortable asking each other sometimes sometimes they get uh self-conscious like they want to be cool like they they don't want to admit they don't know what something means or they'll feel each other out like do you know what that means and a lot of times it's like right. a line in a show or like um you know like a music lyric or something and like nobody totally quite has it right. So I just I love listening to those conversations and I love knowing that they have somebody to school them in the yes. ways of the world. So oh, I love that, too. That has been definitely a through line for me. And now they're all like too dang smart. That's one thing I will say with like you probably will find that Violet is a lot more worldly wise. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure she is now than you could ever have imagined. Oh, totally. Allegra being at that age. Um, And it's just like, well, what are you going to do about it? Like, it just is when kids have older siblings, they just know more. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. And I the the family of origin that I grew up in, because we're two years separated, my brother and I, and I definitely remember like kind of being the older sibling to my brother and explaining things to him. But then we're eight and six years older than my sister. So it was just too separate, kind of. She was yes. so little that we weren't we weren't really like shepherding her along in that way, or at least I wasn't being eight and a half years older. So it's I think it's fun with mine being more closely spaced. And you're right, Violet is just everything. The shows she's watched, the movies she's seen, the music she listens to. Um, and it's it's fun. I I don't relate because I was the oldest and I was pretty sheltered, but it's fun to see this little like, you know, seven year old who knows her way around whatever topic. So. Yeah, I, I think that's funny. I think I was similarly sheltered. My sister's 10 years older and my brothers, I just don't think they were eight and four years older. I just don't think things were being, I was very naive. Let's yeah. just put it that way. <laughs> and my sister likes to tell a story about how she came home with a teen, when she was a teenager with a friend of hers. So she was probably 16 or 17 and I was six or seven. And I had put sanitary napkins all over my dolls because I thought they were diapers. Like I thought they were diapers, I guess. So yeah, my sister and her friends never really let me live that down. And it was one of those like very obvious things that happen when one kid is that much younger than the other. And is so naive and like, it's not like she was teaching me about periods at that age. So, um, okay. So my turn. Yep. Um, another thing I love about siblings is how they, kind of develop this shared language, um, kind of similar to what you were talking about earlier. Like it doesn't have to involve me or include me when you were talking about eavesdropping and listening to kids work things out. And, it, and there's like even something beyond that. There's like the, the references and the inside jokes. Um, my kids all have nicknames for each other um, that are silly. They're just so goofy and mm-hmm. they and sometimes mildly inappropriate. And <laughs> I have nothing to do with that. Like that's all now their own world that they live in. Yeah. And I really just kind of I'm on the outskirts. I don't try to kind of ingratiate myself into it too much. Like it's not about me. Um, And sometimes when I do try to like speak their language, I just end up being kind of the butt of the joke, which I accept that role. It's totally fine. um, As long as they're good, good natured about it. But like, it, it just reminds me that no matter what happens to me, like later in their lives, they have each other. And this is a real connection with or without me. I'm obviously part of it. I'm an important part of it. But like they have a whole thing going on that has nothing to do with me. And yeah. I really like that. I love that. I love that a lot. Um, OK, well, my final one is I just love that having siblings in your house is sort of like empirical proof <laughs> that 
while you can contribute a lot to raising your kids, there is so much that is biologically uh, programmed and hardwired in kids that is beyond your control. And this is true whether or not you're raising siblings, I believe. But when you are raising siblings, you just have the proof that you can, the control of the environment and the two parents and you know, there's so much that is the same of how they are raised and yet they come out so different. And I think the mm-hmm. more kids you have, the more and I know you've talked about this, like when you've had two, you thought there were two different kinds of kids, like a Jacob yeah. kind and an Isaac kind. And <laughs> right. then you had Will. I was like, um, oh, my gosh, there's a third category. <laughs> yeah. Wait, there's another. Yes. Right. And so um, I think this is like bringing it all back to moms. Right. Like, I think that's that relieves some of the pressure that you um that it's all on you to put out this fully formed, you know, grounded and happy Mm. human into Mm -hmm. the world. When you see that kids can be raised in the same household by the same parents and turn out so differently. And there's just so much, there's nature and nurture, I believe, but there is so much nature. Um, And when you see it in front of you from how they look different, like we were talking about at the beginning of the show to how their personalities developed, I feel like it's a little bit of, pressure off of us, right? Because mm-hmm. like there's only so much we can do and and a lot of it is outside of our control. And so siblings just having them in your house is just basically a daily reminder of that. Like yes. we're off the hook for some of this. Yeah, you're so completely right. I have five kids. I've raised them all similarly and they're as different as could be. All yeah. five. Yeah. I also think that the bigger the personality differences I mean, then then it's just more evidence to how hard like how hardwired some of this is. They just come out super different. Um, But the bigger, the wider those personality gaps, um, the the more interesting some of the sibling dynamics are and the relationships and the fights and the and Mm -hmm. everything is just when you have super different kids. Yeah. You know, and in some ways, I feel like the older they get, the more they kind of can almost like lean in on their own personality differences Mm -hmm. and and become who they are even more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, I've definitely seen that with when like I'm thinking of Jacob and Isaac in particular because those were because those were my first two mm-hmm. and their differences were so obvious to me mm-hmm. um, and dramatic in some ways it, it could sometimes be difficult not to compare them or right. be annoyed by one who was whose personality traits were presenting in a particularly challenging way see how diplomatically mm-hmm. I yes. put mm-hmm. that um but now it's like, it's just who they are. And, and I'm just used to it. Like I'm used yeah. to there being every kind of person there is now, well, or at it, least five kinds of people. In a <laughs> so. way, it's kind of like a, a, a gift to have really different kids um, because I feel like it, there could be challenges having, let's say you had same gender, kind of similar personalities, close in age. I think the, the temptation to compare or um, to like try to parent them the exact same way would be actually greater And maybe hard to individuate. I think that's actually a real word. It Um, is. I've heard it before. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It it must be. It must be. Um, So I guess we can see those wildly different oil and water personalities as at least permission for the kids to just be who they are. And for us as parents, Mm -hmm. like we have no hope of parenting the same way, them the same way, because it's so obviously different. So yeah. Um, yeah, super interesting. And I think it makes them all pretty accepting of each other. Like Mm -hmm. when they grow up with lots of different kinds of people they grow up knowing that there are different kinds of people in the world. And that makes them like that, that knowledge on the outside of the world almost makes them more accepting of their siblings. And then that knowing their siblings makes them more accepting of the rest of the world. I think you're so right. I'm glad you said that because that is something I've tried to kind of lean in on, especially when kids, when my kids are talking about things they're good at or things that come Mm -hmm. easily to them. One of them, you know, is really good at math. And, and I just, there's no, you can't squash that. They just notice, they notice when others are, naturally gifted in certain areas. So I've just tried to lean in on that and use that as a way to say, look, we know in the world that certain things come more easily to some people. Some certain things are harder for some people. Certain people run anxious. Certain people like to sleep in in the mornings. And so, yeah, I agree. I think that's a um, it's great for kids to see that in their own families and then use that as a way to kind of build, I don't know, compassion or, yeah. you know, understanding about the whole world. And I think if you don't ever make it, um, competitive in a negative way right. in your house, then they can, they're actually kind of proud of each other yes. for their strengths because everyone's strengths are celebrated. Whereas if like, every, if, if the pie felt small or finite, you get this feeling that everyone's fighting over like mm-hmm. the same piece of, of parental acceptance yeah. or sibling acceptance. 
But I have found that it can be very expansive and that like everyone can really be proud of everybody and really acknowledge everyone else's strengths. And like, I know that, you know, everyone is aware that there is a kid in my family who's extremely artistically gifted. Mm -hmm. And then there's another who's really, really, really smart. And like everyone knows. Yeah. And are, they're all proud of those people for that. Yeah. Those things. And because it doesn't take anything away from them. I um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And we've always just tried to pair the conversation about those kinds of inborn talents with the the corollary which is those kids sometimes are really have challenges in other areas that yeah. like nobody has it nobody has it easy we just have right. some things that come easy and some things that come harder so yeah i love that that's a great a great place to wrap up so this has been really fun and thanks everybody out there for listening so just as a reminder we have two new spotify playlists for the month of february and they are one is called toddler parenting helpline and then the other is called episodes that feel like a hug um, and so these are collections of our episodes. And in the case of the toddler playlist, um, we've also pulled in some episodes from other podcasters we love and they're on Spotify. Um, and so if you are going back through our archives, some people like to listen in order, but there's other fun ways to kind of delve into our archives, maybe by theme. And so that's the idea behind these Spotify playlists. And we just we kind of like Spotify. I mean, everybody has yeah. their own place that they're listening, but the fact that Spotify lets you make a playlist of podcast episodes, I think is so genius. Um, yeah. So that's what we've been doing. And those are the two new ones for February. Yeah, definitely go check those out. Um, you can find the links in the show notes or you can get all of our playlists at themomhour.com slash Spotify. We'll be back Sunday this coming weekend with a brand new More Than Mom episode. And we'll talk to you then. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. Hi everyone, Megan here. Sarah and I would absolutely love it if you would hit pause right now, like right where you're listening, and leave the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, this is one of the biggest ways you can thank us, and it really only takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, you can navigate to the Mom Hour's show listing. So when you're in the episode you're listening to right now, click where it says the Mom Hour just above the play button, and then scroll all the way to the bottom and you will see the ratings and reviews. We would love if you would leave us one as well. Thank you so much for listening.